2, we're continuing our sermon from last week. I asked a couple questions. Last week about, do you know where you are? If you don't know where you are, then you really cannot know how to get where you need to be. And so today we continue uh, on this study of our identity in the church. Uh, I'm going to kind of go over some things. I'll need that circle up there on the uh, screen. But uh, I want to just uh, reiterate some things that uh, to help identify where we are in our spiritual commitment. And I'm going to kind of go over a little bit what we learned last week. We learned about five purposes that God put both you and the church here for, for worship, for fellowship, for discipleship, ministry, and evangelism. Those are the same in your individual life as they are in the church. We talked about community. Uh, uh, and community being those that abstain from the church, those people outside of these four walls uh, that are not involved. The community of people in your neighborhood, your office, your classroom, who are in the sphere of influence that you have, who are within driving distance of the church, that have made no commitment at all, either to Jesus Christ or to the church. They are the unchurched. 60% of America is part of the community that you see. Then we talk about the crowd. The crowd attends church. These are what we call the regular attenders. For the most part, when the doors are open on Sunday, they're here. They come. But the crowd is made up of both believers and unbelievers. It's made up of both disciples and non-disciples. Because even here in Acts chapter 2, as we look at the first church, the crowd included the disciples who were already committed to following Christ. And already made the commitment to their lives to him. But they had one thing in common. The crowd is where the people of worship that takes place. It was that group of people that came and gathered in with them. So you have a mixture of those believers. We understand who that is. Then we talk about the congregation. The congregation that attaches itself to the church. The congregation is where the purpose of fellowship takes place. They understand that the Christian life is, is not just a matter of believing, but it is a matter of belonging. And most people like this, are baptized into the fellowship of believers. So those congregational members are the people who have made that commitment to go from not being a disciple to following Jesus Christ purposely. These are the people who decide to get serious about church. They realize that church is not just a place you attend once a week. It is a place where you can invest your life for God's glory and God's people. Then we talk about, and kind of stop right there, about the committed. We read about these people in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, it says they were continually devoting to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And these are the people who are not just attached to the church, but they assimilate into the church. To put it simply, these are members who decide to move beyond just membership. They want to get serious about their faith. They want to grow in their spiritual commitment. They want to begin to make the journey towards spiritual maturity. They want to grow in the knowledge of the Word of God. They want to learn more about what it means to actually follow Christ. At this point, many of these people are not serving in any ministry, but they desire spiritual maturity. They pray. They come. They are in a small group. They support the church financially. These are the people who are committed to the purpose of discipleship. The step in is the one step necessary for being a disciple to become a reality. The word disciple literally means learner. These people realize that there is nothing to earn as a Christian, but there is much to learn as a Christian. They don't want to just show up in church. They want to grow up in church. Likewise, when a person uh, really gets serious about their commitment to Christ and they really get serious about their walk, with the Lord, there is within them that desire for discipleship, actually to, to become spiritually mature. And so then we are talking about the core. The core assists the church. And we see this group moves to another level spiritually on their commitment. Verse 44 in chapter 2 of Acts says, And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. This group has just moved from the desire of spiritual maturity to a demonstration of spiritual ministry. The church, uh, this is the, the second smallest group of the people within the body. They are the 20 percenters. You know the old adage, 20% of the people do 80% of the work in ministry. That's true. 
10% of the people give 90% of the giving in a church. That's true statistically across America. That means just 10% of the people are basically funding the ministries in this church for us to be able to make an impact in the community. Now, this is a magnificent minority. The core is committed to the purpose of ministry. They don't want to just sit and soak up things. They want to serve and give. They are largely responsible for the outreach to the community and the world as a local church. This group, when it, it has made this commitment with Christ, are making the things happen. They are making sure that we have teachers here to help uh, minister to you. They are the ones helping with the, the parking lot, and, and they pay for those things. And they, they pay for the sound system. They, they are involved uh, completely with the cause of Christ, that they are committed to a, a huge level. They are making an impact, literally. Their motto is kind of like John F. Kennedy's famous line. <coughs> Ask not what your church can do for you. <laughs> ask what you can do for your church. I know it's country. <laughs> That's the best JFK I could do. <laughs> they want to find their spiritual gift and they want to use it. I cannot tell you how grateful every church ought to be for the core. It is the core that makes the church possible. If it was not for the core, there would be no need for the crowd to show up. Because church really couldn't take place. Watch this. The core built this building while we were in the tent. The core provided a place in the community for us to teach children, students, to have support groups, to meet with military guys, to take care of families. The core made that happen. I want to emphasize something. You can be, in one sense, a part of the core before you become part of the committed. You don't have to be a spiritual giant to serve in the church. And some of you may be hung up on that. You can play in the band and sing with the group up here. You can rock babies in the nursery, teach teenagers, park cars, visit hospitals, greet people, direct traffic. There are so many areas of service you can be involved in to assist the church without achieving a high level of spiritual maturity. These people who serve and these people who minister and then the core of the core who make up the leadership of the church, these are the people who form the heart of the church. The commissioned advertise the church. The commissioned is this group within the core that have surrendered to ministry. There are the ministers who are giving their lives completely to say, this is what I'm called to do. They are the directors within the church body that said, here I am, God, use me. And they have completely given their life over to make an impact within the community. The commission to advertise the church. These are the people who want to go back into the community to evangelize the community to begin to get them into the crowd. So they can become part of the congregation, move to the committed, and be part of the core. So they can become part of the commission and go back then into the community. This is how the early church grew so fast. As Peter pointed out in verse 32 when he said, This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Verse 32 in chapter 2 of Acts. You see, a full-fledged disciple, listen to me church, is a disciple maker. When you've reached that, you are making disciples. The commission fulfilled the purpose of evangelism. The community needs the purpose of evangelism, but it is the commission that fulfilled the purpose of evangelism. It is at this point you are fulfilling all five purposes for which God made you. Where are you going? Where are you right now? That raises the big question, how do we make disciples? How do we move people from community into the crowd and then into the congregation and then into the committed? How does, how does that happen? There's one way shown in the model through what we call a baseball diamond. Let's have that throw up there. It's pretty easy to understand. First base is knowing Christ. This is where it all begins. We lead people to know Christ in a personal way so that they can become committed to membership. That is first base. Some of you are on first base. 
That's where you are. Second base is growing in Christ. Everyone knows that in baseball, when you get to first base, your next object is to get to second base. Second base is where you are committed to maturity. Some of you are there on second base. Third base is serving Christ. This is where you go from using God to save you to the point where God can use you to serve him. At this point, you are committed to ministry in some shape, form, or fashion. It may be service through parking cars. It may be ministry through being part of a core, uh, a care group. It may be leadership where you are actually leading a care group. We're going to be starting these after Easter. Some of you have been asked to help and pray about this. But in some way, you are serving Christ. And then there's home play, sharing Christ. <coughs> Pastor Rick Warren, he came up with this baseball diamond illustration in his church in California, and he, he calls people who get to the home plate Grand Slam disciples. This is where you are committed to ministry in some way, where you are committed to being used to Christ, to share Christ, and to help other people become disciples. Now I come back to the original question. Where are you? Where are you in the circles of commitment? Where are you on the base path? Let me give you some wonderful news. No matter where you are in the circles of commitment, you can go deeper whenever you are ready. No matter where you are on the baseball diamond, you can go to the next base, or if you are not even in the game, there is a uniform waiting for you right now. Here's the point of what I've been trying to tell you over the last couple weeks. God has given us a job to make disciples out of every person can. It is your responsibility and mine to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. If you are willing to become what God made you to become so that you can fulfill all five purposes for your life, we're willing to help you. You see, that's what the church is supposed to do. We are to go into the community and, and be a part of that community. We are to reach that child who plays on the grass by himself on Sundays when I drive out that has possibly never been to church. We are to be able to go into our community and talk of Christ so that when people look at us, they would see Jesus Christ. And not because we said the name Jesus Christ, but because of the way we live our life. It is starkly different. It is contrasting to the rest of the world. And it makes them wonder why or what is the difference with that guy or that guy? Are you following Christ? Are you committed to Christ? At what level do you believe yourself to be committed? Some of us, when we look at this, we say, wow, I've been standing on first base this whole time, and the coach has given me the, the sign to go to second. He's saying, man, I, I want you to move. I want you to, to be something more. There, I've got a better plan for you. I've got more for you to do. I've got joy for you to have that you're standing there. Will you commit? A pastor in Alabama tells the story of his son-in-law. Captain Joshua Byers. He was killed in Iraq on July 23rd, 2003. He was a tremendous Christian. He was killed by an IED. It's an improvised explosive device. Some of you guys who meet with us in the military group know what I'm talking about. On the side of the road on Highway 1 near Ramadi, Iraq, <coughs> He was killed. The pastor in Alabama, whose son-in-law it was that died, got to spoke with two men who were in his unit and were there when he passed away. And this is what he found out. Joshua was in charge of moving his company to a new location, which is always dangerous to do because of IEDs. He was in the lead Humvee traveling around 50 miles per hour when the bomb went off. When the bomb exploded, it sent shrapnel through his upper right arm, which was not protected by body armor. The shrapnel went through his lungs 
and in his heart. He died in 10 seconds, the guys tell us. When the explosive hit around 7.30 a.m., it caused the Humvee to roll up onto two wheels. The driver, Timothy Buskell, was almost thrown out. When the vehicle came back down, Josh landed over with his last words to the driver. In the 10 seconds that he had before he would die, he lifted his head and grabbed the driver's leg, and he said, Buskell, keep moving. Think about those words. This man was so focused on his mission and on his purpose, even with his dying breath, he gave his last command. Keep moving. No matter where you are in these circles or on these bases, you can keep moving. That is what we are here to help you do. I would encourage you today, wherever you are with God, get moving and keep moving so you know where you are and you will be where you need to be. Don't buy into Satan trick into having you sit and stay right where you are. Because the church is not for you and me in these walls. Mm -hmm. It's for those people who are dying outside of that. Let's stand together.